Welcome to Being Dad. My name's Ian. I'm a dad of two. I've got one daughter called Kira, who's three years old. I've got one daughter called Rosie, who's one. And I've been married for about six years now. Still to be confirmed if you're for long-term listeners. Hi, uh, my name is Pete. I've been married to Emma for 11 years. And we have a little boy named Frank, who is six years old. Um, hello. Welcome to the Being Dad podcast. Tonight we have our good friend and fellow mentor, Andy Howlett. I'm Andy Howlett, um, one of the parents of mine mentors, just like Pete and Ian. Um, I've been married for ooh, four months. Um, a stepson and a son, both 10 years old. Um, not twins, a couple of months before the, between them, obviously, because one's a stepson. Um, and I've got a 13-year-old daughter that's nearly 25. Before you became a dad yourself, what was your understanding of fatherhood? What did it look like? How did you see that role? Um, my, my dad, all, all the way growing up, he was always an, an authoritarian. Um, he, he worked a hell of a lot. He still, still does work a hell of a lot. Um, just to put food on the table. So um, it, it was always, the, the interactions were more when we'd done something wrong. Me, me and my brother were both brought up a lot by my nan and granddad. When I was born, my granddad was 38. So they, they were young grandparents. However, hell of a lot of respect for my granddad. Um, he passed, passed away some years ago now, um, but I always had a, a lot of respect for my granddad um, just because was authoritarian however he was always there to have the fun with you as well and to be teaching lessons so it's a bit bit of a mixed up one for me really um with like the the father figure really was more my granddad than than my dad well my dad was there and i was not terrified i was i was i, was, I, did, I didn't want to upset him yeah but not in a way that i was scared to upset him if you catch me drift yeah he wasn't um, I don't think he ever had to hit either of us. Just the threat of it was enough. Did you see that as the role of a dad? Was that, I guess, that, that's your only understanding. Our only understanding, really, yeah. is the model of what... So, to provide. Pro pro yeah. Provide and tell, slap us back into line when we're out of line. Yeah. yeah. I think that's something a lot of people... A lot of... I kind of did when I was becoming... When I was becoming a dad, I thought... You kind of think you look back to your own childhood and think what your dad did. And I think I did that as well. I thought that's what I was going to end up being like as a dad. Um. So I mean, like with with that leads on to like our next our next question we were talking about. Was there anything that you felt you misunderstood or that many other fathers misunderstood as as a dad? And I don't know. I thought I was going to be a dad like my dad, and I've become a different dad partly because I'm a different person, partly because the challenges are different. I think when my daughter was first born, I was 24. And I think the understanding that I had was my, my role was to be just like my dad and to just go out, earn the money, provide and be the one that tells you to get back in line. But I was still very wet behind the ears. Um, I didn't, didn't have a clue what I was doing. And my mum would always give me and my brothers lectures about don't be like your dad, you don't want to be like your dad. I could see now the way where mum was coming from with it, in that she wanted him to be home more. Yeah. Um, I mean, granted, whatever time he didn't have when he wasn't working, he'd be in the pub, but a lot of hatred was built in me. Not not hatred. Hatred is a terrible word because I've never once hated my dad. Um, but a lot of Resentment. respect was kind of suppressed. Um, because I was told that this isn't how he should be behaving as your dad. He should be spending every minute of his not work here with you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so that obviously then, that reflected then on my parents in where I was like, no, I'm going to be there all the time. I'm not at work. I'll be there. Yeah. I mean, when when Lou, when Lou was born, um, me and my partner were running a pub. Um, so it was, it was a pub restaurant, so I could take Lily to work with me. You know, she'd come and take her doing the shopping. Yeah. And I made her part of my work day. I mean, it's a shame the mobile phones weren't as popular but <laughs> for 13 years ago. Because if someone could have got a photo, I, I mastered the art 
um, a pour in a pint with a newborn baby in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'd pay for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, mate, if we're ever in a pub, I'll give you, I'll give you, a, I'll give you my youngest, and you can go <laughs> behind the bar and pour a pint. <laughs> if we can still practice it, uh, I'll keep trying to adapt my, um, adapt my role, if you like, as a father. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I take it on uh, the rugby team because what one of my gripes when I was a kid is my dad never came watch me play rugby. Yeah, I, th- I think he watched like two games. Yeah. Um, Either because he was work at work, or because he just got back from work, or because he was getting ready for work. Yeah. Um, and I kind of missed it when I saw the other kids with their dad there. I bet. Yeah. That's so nice. I've, I've I've ended up becoming father to a whole rugby team of kids now, <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure I'm there. And um, you know, I'm going to be the one in the minibus taking a lot of kids to a rugby match and saying, "No, it's all right, I'm here for you." Yeah. Um, that's really lovely to think of that. And when you talked mm-hmm. about you were growing up. I think we didn't mention this before. Um, so my dad was quite distant and again, quite authoritarian, told me off or told me what to do. Didn't really relate to me in any way. Um, and I, I became a father a bit later and I think I probably had time to reflect on things like that. And I, I made an active choice to, to change the way I was going to be a dad and how involved I was going to be and how much, um, I guess, affection and nurture because that became something that I lacked I think when I was growing up I just didn't get it so I thought I'm going to do that so when you say you're now there as like a source of um, I guess comfort and guidance to rugby playing kids that's that's kind of you put in the past right isn't it I, I feel like that's you saying do you know what I'm, I'm able to do something that my dad wasn't able to do for me and and I guess that must feel yeah. quite satisfying. Yeah, that, that's it. Well, that, that, that's a totally different journey again, is the, the coaching side of it. Because um, again, you know, I'd, I'd set my path with my kids. Yeah. Um, and yes, it's wavered and I've had to have some time, some reflection. You've been there for some of my reflection yeah. um, and seeing, and I realized at one point that I was being far too harsh um, on my youngest son when he was at rugby. Okay. Um, constantly on him, constantly on him. Yeah. Um, you know, he was having spells where he'd start crying on the rugby pitch because he'd been tackled. Yeah. I think she said, Aaron, get up, carry on. Um, and then through reflection, then a, a kind of reflection and the help of yourselves and parents in mind and the, the course that we all did, um, the support of everybody there, I really did um, start to, when we, when we went through mindfulness. Yes. Um, and I started mm-hmm. really thinking about, well, how does it feel? Why is he doing it? Yes. So they're just thinking, it's just crying. You know, big, big, biggest biggest kid on the pitch stood there, cried his eyes out. Yeah. Um, so then I thought about it and I broke it down. I thought, um, I, I was never going to work out what it was that was a problem because he wouldn't tell me. He probably didn't even know himself. Um, so just through trying different things. And I, it, it came back to me then that, you know what? I've probably done that myself and blanks out of my own head, but I've definitely felt that way yeah. when I was 10 years old on a rugby pitch thinking, my dad's not here for me. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm stood there supporting everybody else, refereeing a game, making sure two teams are where they need to be and behaving. Yeah. And whereas all the other, well, most of the other kids on that pitch have got parents stood aside saying, yes, come on, come on, come on. Or if they take a bit of a knock, knock, come on, get up, you'll be okay. You know you'll be okay. Yeah. And I'm just like, get up, stop being soft. Yeah. You know, like quite mm. um that, that's where the, the nasty authoritarian comes in, I think. And just thinking about it and thinking how I'd feel in this position. Yeah. You know, and he must have just felt so alone in the middle of our pitch. And I, I felt terrible for it. Yeah. I, re- I really did feel terrible for it. Yeah. Um but then I thought, well, there's no point beating yourself up about it. Just do something about it. So I made a, a pledge to myself. Um, and I, I spoke to Aaron about it um, and just said, I'm going to be more supportive of you. Just remember when when I'm shouting, I'm shouting exactly the same as I shout at everybody else. It just means more to you yeah. because you've not got parents saying, ignore Andy. It's okay. Come yeah. here and give me a hug. Of course. Come and give me come and give me a hug. It's just your coach. He's got to do this. It's like, because... Yeah. 
and uh, want to explain to him the fact that I've got two rules on that pitch, mm-hmm. and yeah. when they're on pitch and in the match, I've got everybody else I've got to look after. So it's more um, the coach side takes over more than the dad side. Yeah, uh, I said that, mm-hmm. and now after, after every match, I'll give him a hug, tell me great match, and. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping it's building. It seems to be building a better relationship between us. That's for really that, nice. that's really nice. Um, I, I guess that must have taken a lot for you to examine yourself a bit there and go, "Do you know what? I got it wrong, and I'm, I'm going to make it right now." Because I think that takes a lot of guts as a parent yeah. to, to admit that you've got it wrong and actually to say that. I think that takes a lot of guts doing that. Yeah, I, I think it took me a while to admit those doing it wrong. Um, when I when I first had the, the realization that um, that something wasn't right, it was uh, I could be doing this better, and that that's what I was thinking. I, I could be doing this better. How could I be doing this better? I didn't for one moment even consider the fact that I could just be doing everything totally wrong. Well, not everything, but that there were aspects I was doing totally wrong. It's like we, we did that session on mindfulness, um, and I, I found that. I found that amazing. I really did because it really helps. Because we watched a couple of little clips, didn't we? From Inside Out was the Inside one. Out. In, Inside Out. Yeah, yeah. Inside Out, um, and I think then uh, I got the tools to be able to really start thinking. You know what? Well, you're not doing it right, but how wrong are you? Are you doing it? Yeah. yeah. And you got to make little changes, but that that one was quite a drastic change that I had to make. Through a series of mini changes, yeah, but. it's not it's not easy realizing as a parent you've made a mistake. So you know, kudos for yourself to yourself to actually sort of realizing that and going through the steps that to make that change. Well, one thing that I, that I probably hadn't realized until I started speaking about it now is that the important thing with, with mindfulness, like I said, is to do it regularly. It's really easy to start slipping back into old habits, go back to status quo. Um, which there, there we go. I've just had another enlightened moment now. I'm thinking back to the the last couple of weeks of rugby training, thinking, yeah, I'm slipping back to grump, to the grump. Can I ask a question? Have you, um, have you spoke when you spoke to your lad about this? Do you say to him, "Well, I'm I'm trying, but if if you need to tell me, you need a bit of dad." tell me and I'll understand and I'll be the dad for five minutes or, or however you mm. think it's best to do it between the two of you. But I will do things like, I'll say to him individually, do you want to come and help me do this or do you want to come and help me do that? You know, just if they've, they've got the opportunity then to have time just with me to themselves. Yeah, um, I mean, granted, it might be, come and help me clean the car. Can you come and help me get this out of the shed? Can you come and help me do that? Yeah, And I, 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 can, I can tell when they need um, that child dad time mm-hmm. because yeah. but yeah I, th- I think that's something that I was lacking with my dad um, because me, me and my brother were really close you know there's 12, 12 months 12 months 10 days between us um, so neither of us got time just with uh, with our dad That that's something that I think is important to kids to get that one on one time yeah. um, where they can open up and tell you stuff Um, we've spoken about your own struggles with your mental health as a new dad. Um, did you have anyone who you could talk to who understood and maybe help? Mum was struggling really badly with a, a lot worse than I ever was with po- postnatal depression. Um, caused a lot of rifts within my family because of it, because none of my family were allowed to come and visit. Um, friends I kind of distanced myself from because I thought they might be able to see me weakness. Quite a lot of my friends at the time, all my kids at the same time, all appeared to be um, coping really well. You know, just put put a brave face on. Yeah. But I think the biggest, the biggest, biggest thing for me uh, was I didn't want to admit to myself that I wasn't coping. Did you think it was weak? Did you judge yourself? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. 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 Because, again, I was comparing myself to other people. 
yeah. for their photos on Facebook and from when they come and see me and it was always happy smileys, smiles um, slept, slept right through the night from being born um, <laughs> and then you start to doubt yourself then about well what am I doing wrong yeah you know what, what am I doing wrong I must be doing something wrong yeah. so then you get into the lie yourself you're like oh yeah 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 she's slept right through but struggle wake her up most of the time you know she wakes up for her feet goes back to sleep is very really easy like competitive parenting and, and yeah. Just yeah, yeah 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 so I just kind of like I say got got lost in the whole in the whole lie of everything's perfect I think if you tell people that everything's perfect so that many times you, you kind of start believing it yourself So what moment did you start saying being a bit more truthful with yourself? What was kind of the kicker for that? And uh... oh, I can tell you the exact point uh, because everything seemed to break down at the same time when we found that the pub they were running, the owners decided that they were uh, selling it. They'd had enough. There you go. You got a week to move out. Wow. Um, so you can imagine there now the stress built up. I've got a minute and I've got no job. Nowhere to live because we were living in the pub. Jeez. Got a week to find somewhere, and we ended up moving in with my ex's mum. That didn't go well at all. That lasted three weeks because she wants us to get our own house. She said the only way I can do this is if I make you homeless. So, kick, kicked us out to bump us up the housing ladder. We ended up spending six weeks in Shirley House, uh, the homeless shelter before they did it all up. Um, and it was dreadful. <laughs> That's the other way I can put it, it was dreadful. Yeah. Um, we, we spent, I think I think we spent a couple of months there. I don't know, it's kind of all a blur now. I think, it, I think it's like PTSD and it's just all kind of been blurred out of my mind. Mm-hmm. But there was definitely a period of time that we were in there while we were waiting for, ha- for a house. So it could have been eight weeks, it could have been 12. Um, but you know, you see lots of other people in the same position as you while you're there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of when I hit rock bottom. I'm in a homeless shelter with a baby that isn't even one yet, a partner who is just drinking all the time to cope with it. So I think that's when I hit absolute rock bottom and just broke down. Yeah. You know, that, that, that was it, you know, it was like losing patches of hair. Yeah. Um, just a truly, truly terrible time. We, we, we eventually got housed, uh, moved in a week before my daughter's first birthday. But then it was probably 12 months later that I hit proper rock bottom, you know, just because that's the problem with the peaks and troughs, isn't it? You know, you the higher you go, the further you got to fall. Yeah. Um, I mean, now that, I look back, and all, all the people who were saying, why didn't you speak to us? Why didn't you say anything? Yeah. Now, the, the, law, the, the law told me, well, we could see it. We knew it. When, when it hits you. And you sit there thinking, you know what? For two years, I've been living with this. Yeah. And the guilt that I felt, because th- those two years, it was the first two years of my daughter's life. Yeah. I don't remember a hell of a lot of it. I really don't like, like say, we spent however many months in a homeless shelter and I remember very little of it very little of it because I just kind of blanked out of my mind and yeah I felt a lot a lot of guilt afterwards seven years after that no my, my daughter was seven when I eventually realized that I'd been in a seven-year depression with the peaks and troughs and I felt like I was pretty happy at the time but then when I went on a separated parents information program yeah. and they, they actually explained depression and depression curve, it was only then that I realized that, you know what, I am actually now feeling better, but I'm still at the bottom. I'm still, I'm still only just teetering above rock bottom. Yeah. We all go through that. We're functioning okay. And we've said it quite a few times in, in the group is where we, we go into survival mode and you just think about yeah. it. I've just got to get through this. I've got to get through this this yeah. period and I'll be okay. But then that period lasts for a lot longer than you think. And it's like, yeah. it's only when you're at a point of like more stability and you look back and you go, 
I have no idea how I've just got through that last 12 months. I, I don't know yeah. what I was doing, but I functioned somehow. Um, it's also, it also is why it amazes me how when you're going through those those difficult times, how much you you hide things and how much you change your, your way of doing just to try and, um, for, I suppose, blend in, really, or, or just... The, the objective of the day is just to kind of get get through it without being noticed um yeah, it's amazing how sometimes just people just and it happens for such a long period of time as well yeah well i think it's probably about five years for me wow F- five years of just drinking every night you know the last five years i've just drank through it i don't remember bugger all of uh, my, my daughter's been born. I'm not bonded with my son. Something's got to change. Yes. Is there anything you want to say to summarise or is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, but I think just, just in case anybody does just skip to the end because I've got fed up with me rambling. Um, I, I suppose the, the main thing is don't doubt yourself and don't judge yourself against what other people um, appear to be. Um, you know, and just believe in yourself, really. Believe yourself as a, as a parent and a, a father. It's not an easy job. There isn't a manual for it because otherwise it would there would be an idiot's guide to fathering, um, which, I'll tell you what, you make a fortune if you can write that. <laughs> but... Well, yeah, but th- thanks for having me on anyway. I've really enjoyed it. You've been a wonderful, wonderful guest. And I'm hoping we've uh, touched upon some important topics there for anyone watching or anyone listening. Um, thank you again. This is the Being Dad podcast. Ian, did you want to say something? I was going to say, I think we've got a business idea for a book. If we ever get around to writing a book. I'm right. <laughs> the idiot's guide to, to dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll do a couple of chapters. <laughs> oh, well thanks gents thanks again 